today is National Day of Prayer. Prayer obviously was on my mind, so I thought it appropriate to talk about prayer tonight. There's a lot of misconceptions, I think, about prayer. There's a lot of, there's a million sermons that can be preached on prayer. There's a million Bible studies that can be done and have been done on prayer. I remember when I was in, um, when I went back to school to get my theology degree, we had a class um, that was, uh, it used material from another um, minister or another, like, school, and they just kind of piggybacked it and, like, Two nights into the class, uh, our, our instructors came in and they were like, we're not using this. Just get rid of the book, get rid of it, we're done. We're, we're not using this. So even among theologians, even among teachers, um, there's discrepancies. There's things that they believe that you don't believe. There's things you believe they don't believe. None of it's going to determine whether or not we go to heaven or hell. You know, the bottom line is we all believe in Jesus and we're getting there one way or the other. <laughs> So it is not a thing to get caught up on, but it is something that we do tend to get caught up on. We do tend to worry, is God hearing my prayers? Especially when we feel like we're praying for the same thing for years with no perceived answers. Especially when we are in a very difficult time and we need an answer now and we don't feel like God's moving fast enough. <laughs> we do wonder, am I being effective? Is there something I could do better? Is there something I could do different that would make me feel like I've done a good job? Now, we've been taught... Um, oftentimes in our lives that there's all people who say, I don't know how to pray. I'm not sure how to pray. And then what they're saying is, I don't know how to wax on eloquently like a wonderful theologian in the pulpit. That's what they're saying. Um, and, and that is a taught method, if you will, of prayer. I don't believe that that minister is any less sincere than the guy who has a three-word prayer. But I do believe that is a prayer that is meant to cover everybody's prayers. And so they're trying to touch all the bases, which makes it last a lot longer than it has to. Um, your prayer doesn't have to be like that. Uh, the disciples had learned a way of life. They had learned a way of going to the temple and offering sacrifices. They had learned about offering tithes. They had learned about so many things from the Pharisees of their time. And then Jesus came on the scene and he's like, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Stop doing that. They're a pit of vipers. Who cares what they think? You know, he began to just spin it. And so we see in the life of Jesus in Matthew 6, that they finally look at Jesus and they go, well, how are we supposed to pray? Because now we don't even know that we're doing that part right. <laughs> they were like, they were as lost as we are because we've been raised in a, in a belief system that we're just now realizing isn't really what the Bible says. And we're finding a grace that is beautiful. And so it's left us going, well, how do I even pray then? Is there even a rule to that? Is there even a method to that? Is there either even something that that can go with? And the same thing Jesus answered to them then it's a perfect answer to us now if we're in a moment of going, how do I pray for this? Nathan and I were um, in the running for a house with Habitat for Humanity, and I said several times, I don't know how to pray for that. Because I, I want to pray, Lord, let us get the house. I said, but on the other hand, if we get it, that means the other family doesn't get it. And I don't want to pray misfortune because it's as important to them as it is to us. And I said, I don't know how to pray because this is the first time my prayer can hurt someone else. And I don't want to pray that. And so I often said it was just uneasy because I didn't know how to pray. When the truth is, Jesus told us exactly how to pray in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. So we're going to look at that really quick as we start um, and then go back and kind of talk about it. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Therefore, you should pray like this. Our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. Do not bring us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, you probably know the King James Version of Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be the name. It's the same thing. It's the Lord's Prayer. So the disciples have gone, come and said, Lord, how do we pray? And he says, pray like this. So we teach our children from a very young age to memorize Matthew 6, 9 through 13, because we want them to know this is how you pray. The problem is the church has begun to see this as a literal thing. Jesus saying you have to say these words. That is not what he was saying. The disciples of the time knew what he was saying because in the first verse, the first part of that passage, he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All he's saying is identify who you're praying to. Because it's important to identify who you're praying to because, number one, it reminds you who you're praying to. That you're not just talking to a wall. You're talking to the God, the King of Kings. And the second thing is we know that the power of the name of Jesus is unrivaled. So by just invoking his name when you start, you begin in a power that's incomparable anywhere else. He's saying you're going to start in power, and you're going to start knowing its power because you're going to know who you're praying to. That's all. He's not saying literally say, Our Father who art in heaven. He's saying remember who you're praying to and remember the power that's in that prayer. And then he goes into the next verse when he says, um, 
uh, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I just, I had a complete brain fart. I'm not feeling well tonight, so hold on. So in the second verse of this passage, it's actually verse 10. He says, let your kingdom come, your will be done again. He's just saying your will be done. He's saying when you don't know what to pray, when you're not sure, pray his will. Lord, help me see what your plan is so I can be on board. Help me see so I can pray according to your will. I want to pray according to my will. Usually when I do things my way, it doesn't end well. <laughs> I think we've all been there where we've done things our well way and gone. That didn't go how I wanted it to go. He's just saying get yourself lined up with God's will because that's always holy. That's always good. And truthfully, any dialogue and interaction with God, that should always be the purpose to honor him and to do as he's called in your life. And then he goes in verse 12 when he says, give us this day our daily bread. And here in scripture, 1 John chapter 1, he says, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. He's talking about Jesus there. And then when Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus identifies himself as the bread. And then in the Lord's Supper, he says, Take this bread, which is my body. He's making a very literal reference to him being the bread. So when he says this, he's simply saying, you have to have the word daily. You can't pray to God and not know who he is. You can't pray to God and not know what he promises. You can't pray to God and not know that he has a plan and a purpose. You can't pray to God and never open your Bible. It doesn't work that way. You can pray all you want, but when you do that, that's why you walk away feeling unfulfilled. That's why you walk away doubting that it was true. Because you don't know what you're praying. You don't know that God's will for your life is good. And that it is holy. And that it is predestined. And that he's ordering your steps. You don't know any of that. Because you haven't daily taken the bread. You haven't walked with Jesus. So he's saying if you need to pray where you feel close to God. Daily take the bread. <laughs> do that in a way that you can do that. And then in verse 12 he goes on in to say forgive us our debts as we have forgiven. This is simply if you go back to the Greek. This is echoing Paul's statements later on, excel in the grace of giving. You should never have a debtor as a Christian. Nobody should ever owe you money because if you have the money to give away, give it. And I know that's hard, but if somebody comes to you and they say, I need $700 and you have $700 to give, you give it. You say, it is a gift. God's blessed me to be able to do that. You take it. Now, if they are insistent on paying you back and they show up two days later to give you 700 bucks, Count it as a gift. Say thank you and move on. They may never show up with the money. They may have needed that gift. Who knows? But you don't have anybody owe you anything because that's not excelling in the grace of giving. If you can't afford to give them $700, you can't afford to loan it. A million of your relationships will be better off when you look at giving, whether it's money or, or a cardigan or a Tupperware dish. There's been some fights over Tupperware dishes. <laughs> if you can't afford to give that sucker away, don't loan it. As Christians, Jesus is just saying here, you should never have a debtor. You're forgiving your debtor. That's saying you're going to excel in the grace of giving. It's just going to be a gift. Let it be done. Christians should not be in court suing each other for money. Where's your generosity there? Where is your excelling in the grace of giving? That's what he's saying here. When you pray, pray that God allows you to have enough to give so that there's no debtors in your life. And then he closes us, closes us out. It's not bringing us into temptation, but delivering us from evil. Again, when he first mentions that we want to be in the will of God, pray God's will. Here he's saying, Lord, keep our path in your will. Don't let us wander from it. Don't let us stray from it. Don't let us forget about it. Because if I'm in your will, I'm far from the evil one. Satan's not going to tread on God's doorstep. He knows better. He knows he has to flee when Jesus' name is invoked. He knows that. He's already lost the war. He knows that. He just wants to take as many casualties with him as he goes. So when you begin to say, Lord, let, let me stay righteous. Let me stay on the right path. Don't let me get confused. Don't let me get tempted by material things. Don't let me get tempted by somebody who's a smooth talker. Don't let me lose sight of your kingdom, of your plans, and of your purposes. Because when I'm there, I'm untouchable. When I'm there, the evil one doesn't stand a chance. Jesus is saying, protect yourself. With the will of God. Protect yourself by knowing what the will of God is. So that's what we pray when we don't know what to pray. The Lord's Prayer is the perfect prayer for every situation. If you ever get yourself home and you're getting ready to pray and you just are exhausted and you're like, Lord, I don't know. Identify 
thank him always and just go through the keep me in your will. Let me know what you want for me. Let me know where it's at. Let me have the courage and the stamina to stay in your will, even if I don't agree with it. Because there have been times when his will was completely opposite of what mine was. And I was extremely hard-headed. And I don't want to do what he wanted me to do. And I wasn't going to do what he wanted me to do. I could have saved myself so much heartache if I prayed, God, let me stay in your will. Line me up with your will. I never prayed for God to line my heart up with his. I prayed for God to change my situations. I prayed for God to open this door. I prayed for God to make that person nice. I prayed. I never said, Lord, make me be like you. Make me want what you want. When I finally started praying, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours, I was not prepared. <laughs> For him to answer that prayer. But that is exactly what he wants us to pray. How else can we minister to the very people he sent us to minister to if it doesn't even bother us when they're in trouble? Our hearts have to break for what breaks his. And what breaks his is his kids not knowing who he is. Not knowing how to talk to him. I, I, I try desperately to make sure the day never comes when my boys don't know how to talk to me. And I've been with people who say, I don't know how to talk to my parents. I can't talk to my dad about that. I wouldn't even know where to start. I don't want my boys to ever have those words come out of their mouth. I want them to know whatever it is, how they can talk to me. And I can't imagine how much more so God feels that way. And in his infinite wisdom and in his love that's perfect, how much more so he feels that way. These kinds of prayers, the Lord's Prayer, when we pray to be in his will, when we pray to be generous with our giving, when we pray these things, these things seek God and not ourselves. And what better way to honor him than have him even be the focus of our prayers? Rarely is God the focus of our prayers. It's, um, he's, he's, a, he's the way to get our prayer. It's like, yeah, I'm praying to God, but I want the car. God's not the subject. The car's the subject. You know, it's, I need the house. God's not the subject. The house is the subject. I need this relationship fixed. The relationship becomes the subject. The Lord's Prayer reminds us that God is the subject. The other stuff is the blessings and the fruit that grows out of a relationship with him. That will naturally occur... When you pray that God keep you in the path of his will. When you pray that way. Um, when I was studying about this, I was reminded about a story. I, heard, I don't know if it's real or not. Because it was like said in a sermon or a Bible study somewhere. But there was a little boy, um, little Billy, and he joined the Cub Scouts. And he hadn't been with the Cub Scouts two or three meetings. And they sent him home with a little wooden block and this little you know, set of tires and these little stickers and, and an instruction book. And they said... Go home with your daddy, do this, and we're going to have a big thing at the end of six weeks or whatever. So Billy goes home, but Billy didn't have a daddy. Billy's just got a mom. So mom's like, we'll figure it out. The instructions are right here. Ha ha, Kennedy. So they figure it out. And they build this little pine box wood derby car. And they think it's wonderful and it's beautiful. And they're so thrilled that they could figure it out. And they don't need no man and whatever. <laughs> and so they go back to the Cub Scouts meeting when it's time to race. And they get there. And there's several other little boys. And their cars are filed down for speed, and they're painted. There's Some of them have, like, the soldering wood names on the side. It's very obvious it was a father-son project, whereas Billy's was a Billy project. <laughs> the mom had helped tell him what to do, but there was no refinement. There was no, oh, this is the point. It was, for them, the point was to follow the instructions and make it work. Whereas the other boys, the point was speed. The point was to win. The point was to be remembered. And so the dads were able to incorporate that into the car. So they start this derby race. Little Billy's car, Blue Lightning, and all the other cars. And they do it in heats. And by the end of the afternoon, Blue Lightning with little, little Billy makes it to the final cut with this other kid whose car is very shiny. It's painted. It's got decals. It's smoked all of the rest of the cars. No contest. So Little Billy looks up in their yard and he's like, can I have a minute to pray? And so they all say, yeah, you can pray. So Little Billy goes off by himself. He bows his little head. And about a minute and a half later, he says, all right, let's go. So they race. Little Billy's car wins, not by much, just by like a little bit, but it wins. And they all cheer. And the Cub Scout leader says, so God answered your prayer. You prayed to win. And he said, no, I prayed I wouldn't cry if I lost. And I thought, how beautiful is that? Because he didn't pray to be successful. He prayed that God would console him. He prayed that success wouldn't matter more than God loving on him. The only thing that mattered was that God took away the grief or the pain or the sadness of knowing he wasn't going to win. Because he knew in that moment he wasn't going to win. It was done. He had accepted it. So his next mission was, Lord, I don't want a miracle here. 
I just don't want to cry. I want you to shield me from embarrassment. We don't pray that way. We either pray, Lord, give me the success, give me the win, we pray that, or we pray in defeat instead of acceptance. We go to God and we cry about the loss. Lord, you know, I've lost. None of it works. I'm not good enough for you. I tried that over and over. It didn't work. And we just, we lament the loss. Instead of looking at God and saying, make me be able to be okay with this. Because whatever happens, your will is your will. Doesn't mean not maybe that your will is that I win. Maybe your will is that I lose. Regardless, your will be done. And that's what I'm going to pray for. And I'm going to pray you make me okay with that. Because by not crying, that meant he was okay with that. That wasn't going to upset him. We don't pray that God makes us okay with his will enough. We just pray that God gives us what we want. And when we don't get what we want, we would lament over it. <laughs> we tell everybody so they can cry with us. We Misery loves company. We don't do a little billy and say, Lord, make me okay with it. The Lord's prayer is perfect to do that. Now, you don't always have to pray the Lord's prayer. That just helps you get started. Any prayer is effective. It can be a, um, when we drop by, I don't know if they're homeless, the people that are panhandling. Some of them probably are. Some of them may not be. But when we drop past them, it's not uncommon for me to just reach out and be like, Lord, help them. I don't know if they're they're one of these people that are scamming people. I don't know if they're legit not having any money. I don't know if they have a job and they're short this month. I don't know their circumstance. I don't need another circumstance to pray for them. And I will just be in a conversation or I'll be singing along with the radio and I'll see them and I'll just go, Lord, Lord, help them. If they're scammers, they need the help of the Lord to be honest people. <laughs> if they're not, they need us help. Who cares why they need it? They do. And I keep on driving and keep on with my conversation. That prayer is as powerful as if I sit down and do the Lord's prayer. God hears that. God's beginning to make my heart break for what breaks his. He knows when I see that there's a, there's a chink <laughs> to the armor there. There's a moment a recognition of I can't do anything about that situation. An acceptance that I can't, but you can. You know, I'm going to call you into this because the Lord knows I can't fix that. <laughs> and so you can do any kind of prayer. It works. And what happens when we pray, no matter what we're praying or what style we're using, prayer moves us. Prayer will move you. It doesn't move God. you got to remember, Jesus lives inside of you. Every step you take, he is with you. Every word you say to every person you say it to, he is a front seat witness to. So if you act like a Karen, Jesus is watching. <laughs> he knows you acted like a Karen, and we're all guilty of acting like a Karen. <laughs> We've all done it. There have been moments, I can't remember what she was talking about, my mom said this week, she said, and I got so mad, and I thought, oh, I sounded just like a Karen. <laughs> We've all had moments where we just pop off without thinking. Jesus is there in that moment. He knows what you're saying, but when we pray... It puts us in remembrance of that. It doesn't change the fact Jesus is there. When we pray, Lord, inhabit the praises of your people. Instead, I say thank you for inhabiting because he's here. Whether or not you acknowledge it, whether or not you know it, whether or not you accept it, is in your ballpark. But he is here. The scripture says that he is here. And so when we pray, it moves us in our minds to a place of proximity of Jesus. It gets us to a place where we know he's for real here. Because we tend to forget that in our day-to-day -day activities. Jesus lives in you. He's not wandering around somewhere. So what prayer does is it moves us back into God's presence because we have stepped out of it. We have chosen something over honoring him with our actions, with our words, or whatever. I stopped a long time ago saying I talked to myself. I decided a long time ago that any time I was tempted to talk to myself, I would say Jesus, and then I would say whatever it was I was going to say. So that people would say, well, you're talking to yourself. I'd go, no, I'm talking to Jesus. And it put me in remembrance of Jesus is constantly there. So if I'm going to, if I've done something stupid and I think, Joe, you're such a moron. If I go, Jesus, I'm going to need your help on this one. It changes how you talk to yourself when you're talking to Jesus and not yourself. It changes your ability to forget he's standing right there. Because if you're talking to yourself, you still haven't remembered he's a participant in this life. He's not just ride along. He's supposed to be active in your life. And so if you stop talking to yourself and use those moments to talk to Jesus, you get moved into that. You're back into God's presence. And here's the thing about prayer. We think prayer is our chance to go to God and tell him all the things. The things he's done, the things he needs, the things we need, the things we, all the things. Prayer is where we go to do that. But the truth is God isn't waiting on your request. He's waiting on you. God knows what you need. He knows if you're hungry. 
He knows if you're uncomfortable. He knows if you're brokenhearted. He knows if you're grieving. He is right there with you doing it. He knows. He doesn't need you to say, God, I need this. He needs you to just say, God, because what happens is outside of prayer, God never gets our undivided attention. We, we get distracted. We never stop it. Like I said, I'm driving down the road. Lord touched him. I believe he hears that. But I'm looking at this traffic light. I'm talking to the... My, my attention is not undivided on God. And he knows that. Scripture says that he is a jealous God. And we like to think about that in terms of worshiping idols and things of that nature. The truth is, when you talk to him, he wants your undivided attention. When Nathan and I go to dinner, or when I'm talking to Nathan, and he has his phone in his hand, it drives me up a wall. Drives me crazy. And I've become worse than a Karen. I'll just be like plotting his murder to his face. I'm like, I'm going to sail away to Bermuda with all the money, the life insurance money I'm going to get, because I watch enough true crime to know how to get rid of your body. Nobody would know. Ever. I could probably forget through the methods I could use. <laughs> And I get angry and I constantly say, look at me with your face. I'm listening. No, no, no. Look at me. <laughs> I'm talking and I want you to hear me. I will admit half the time it is literally just blathering. It's nothing of it really import. Still, I'm talking. Look at me. <laughs> and I get frustrated. And in those moments, I have to remember God's probably a lot the same way. When we just casually worship in the car, when we just casually say a prayer, when we just... He's going, listen with your face. <laughs> He's going, look at me. Watch me. Because we go to prayer and we make it a dialogue and we don't ever shut up and sit. How's he going to answer the prayer if you get up and leave before he has the chance? People say, God never answers my prayer. Do you ever sit and pray to God and not say a word? Well, you can't pray if I'm not saying, yes, you can. Because all you're doing is giving your undivided attention to God. And if you're sitting there just basking in his presence... He's going to talk to you. He longs to talk to you. But if you don't have an undivided attention, you're not going to hear him. Most of the time, if I don't have Nathan's face looking at me, he will ask me a question about what I just told him. 99% yeah. of the time, I have to repeat myself to Nathan Lee. And it's not because he's deaf. It's because he wasn't listening. And I know it. So I'll say, I, he'll ask questions. I'll be, I'm not repeating myself. You should have listened. If you want to know, you should listen. And I get all hateful and angry and I don't answer him. God's not like that, thank goodness. He will repeat himself. <laughs> he will show you. He will have somebody say it to you, and you'll think, that sounds familiar. Probably because he said it while you were praying and you weren't listening. <laughs> That's how that goes. It needs us to focus on you. How often does God get our undivided attention? Prayer simply focuses us completely on the Father. Now, then we get to corporate prayer. That's when we're all together. Um, Thursday, we're going to have corporate prayer. There's times we did... Um, I don't remember what we called it. We did a corporate prayer service before the elections, mm -hmm. intercession, 2021, something. I don't know. We, it was, had a fancy name. I was impressed myself. But we prayed corporately together for the same thing so that we were all in one accord. So when we pray corporately, I do want you to know, praying with company makes a statement. Because if you pray together with a group, two, three people, 200 people, whatever, that prayer is not more powerful than the prayer you say at, your, at the foot of your kid's bed for that fever to break. That prayer corporately is not stronger than that single prayer. But what happens corporately is that shows Satan a unity he can't trump. Satan divides and conquers. He gets you alone. He can make you feel isolated. He can make you feel depressed. He can make you doubt that people love you. He can make you doubt that you're a part of something. He gets you alone. It's a lot easier to take you on. But if you're in the presence of company, it's a lot harder for him to divide and conquer that way. Satan hates unity. And so what happens is your prayer isn't stronger. It becomes more effective because you have provided insulation between you and the evil one. You have provided a buffer, if you will, that he can't penetrate. He doesn't like it. <laughs> so you find yourself feeling more powerful when you pray corporately. Your prayer is just as important singularly to God as your corporate prayer, but your corporate prayer backs the enemy off. It's a battle you can handle because there's more of you. It's a battle you can fight better. There was, um, for corporate prayer, there was a doctor, Randolph, I wrote it down because I don't want to mess up his name because this is a real story. Dr. Randolph Bird was a cardiologist 
at San Francisco General Medical Center. He's a heart doctor. He works on hearts. And he created a big stir in the medical community several years ago because he had a group of volunteers pray daily for a group of patients in the coronary care unit. So, like, he had five or six volunteers, and he wanted them to pray for a patient 1, 7, 12, 19, 22, and 28. He wanted them to pray for those. And then he had a control group of patients who weren't getting prayer, that they weren't to pray for. So that second group of heart disease patients were the control group. He didn't tell the patients they were getting prayed for. He didn't tell the nursing staff. He didn't tell the um, coordinating doctors. Lots of times if you're in for heart disease, there'll be a pulmonist and there'll be a dietitian and there'll be other things. Nobody knew but him who was getting prayed for and that a prayer was even going on that he was doing this little mini experiment. At the end of the experiment, those in the prayed for group were five times less likely to require antibiotics. Those in the pray for group didn't need ventilators to help them breathe. And they didn't know they were being prayed for. It wasn't a sight, because a lot of people say, well, when you pray and you get better, you're just telling your mind's playing tricks. These people had no idea somebody was praying for them. Five times less likely to need an antibiotic and didn't need a vent at all, compared to the control group who obviously had to have those things. Dr. Berg wrote in this medical paper, quote, the evidence strongly suggests faith in God truly is linked to longevity and health. <laughs> that was his conclusion of his little mini study. Now, I don't know why he was doing the study. I don't know if he wanted to disprove Christianity. I don't know if he just was curious. I don't know if somebody asked him to do it. Who knows? I couldn't figure that out. But I thought that is corporate prayer at its best. Because those people had no idea. So when we corporately prayed, before the elections for Donald Trump and for Joe Biden and for Kamala Harris and for James Kay and Mayor Trotter, when we prayed for all of these politicians, they had no idea we were saying them by name and asking God to move in their life. We had no idea what they needed. Like these prayer groups, they weren't told this guy might be on a bed or this guy might need, they weren't told anything. They were like, this is patient one, pray for them. They knew they had some kind of heart condition because he was a cardiologist. That's what they knew. We knew they were some kind of politician. We knew they were up against you know, needing votes and that. We knew a general idea of their state, but we didn't know anything privately. And we have no idea the effect of our corporate prayer on their lives. We don't know which one had a kid that was sick, that wasn't sick after the election. We don't know which one had a mama that was, that was at odds and not talking to them, that all of a sudden was mended after the election. We don't know the little things that we may never see because those, those heart patients never saw the prayer. They didn't know, but they were better for it. God's word does not come back in vain. It doesn't. He promises to fulfill. He promises to protect. He promises to answer prayers, and he promises to be with us. You are not more powerful with more people, but Satan sees unity. And where there is unity, there is power. It is easier to fight a battle when people are helping you than if you're doing it alone. <laughs> I mean, if you want to take somebody on... It gives you a lot more confidence if somebody's with you. <laughs> it just does. If you're alone and you want to tackle something that you're not very confident in, it's harder to do that because Satan's got you alone versus if you have someone or lots of someone's <laughs> standing behind you helping you do that. So when do we pray? A lot of people will tell you you got to pray first thing in the morning. you got to pray over your day before anything happens. you got to pray God's protection. you got to pray God's provision. you got to pray God. you got to do it all before the day starts. Well, if you feel convicted and you should pray first thing in the morning, by all means pray first thing in the morning. Sometimes I get the chance to do that. Sometimes I do not. Sometimes we oversleep. And so I get up and I'm like, boys, let's get rolling. <laughs> you got to get your breakfast. You got to get your food. Then we got to pack your lunchbox. We got to get everything. And I haven't taken half an hour to just sit with Jesus. I ain't got time to do that right now. Jesus, you know I love you. We got to get through this morning. And I get everybody off to school and I get everything handled. And then I might get it at about 10 o'clock. I'll be able to sit and talk with Jesus. Does that mean I don't have his protection up until 10 o'clock? Of course not. That means I need to give him my undivided attention, and I can't do it if my kid won't put his stupid shoes on for the third time today. <laughs> he knows that about me. He knows I want to be with him, but he also knows that that child is going to have to be told five more times. He knows. He made that child as much as he made me. I don't know why he made him like that, but he did. <laughs> he knows. A lot of people say you pray at the end of the day because you got to... You can't thank him for stuff that haven't happened yet. So at the end of the day, everything's happened, and you can be thankful for the surprises that may come along. And you can, it becomes a prayer of gratitude instead of a prayer of I want. Like if you pray first thing in the day, 
nothing's happened to be thankful for. So you just end up saying, I want protection. I want uh, an open door. I want a bed. You just ask for a bunch of stuff. Versus if you pray at night, you're more grateful because you have all this stuff to be thankful for. I don't know about you, but I think there's plenty to be thankful for without the day starting. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's a lot that can still fill up a thankfulness prayer, point, frankly. But again, if you feel convicted and that's the best time for you, for me, I'm on a certain medication that has worked wonders. But about an hour and a half after taking it, I ain't talking to anybody. I'm sorry. We try to stay up Friday nights with the kids, and I fight that medicine as hard as I can because it's family game night. But two and a half hours in, the speech is getting slurred, and it's starting to look like mom's a little drunk because I just, the medicine is ready to make me go to sleep. And I'm like, all right, I'm out. <laughs> I'm done. Jesus knows he's not going to get much out of me if we wait till bedtime. I'm out of my control. The medicine's going to do that. He knows that. A lot of people, <laughs> they just pray when they have meals when they go to church. Because they have corporate prayer, and then that gives them individual prayer. They thank God, they ask God not to make them sick, and they pray for other people, and so they feel like all their bases are covered. If that makes you feel good, please pray at every meal and pray when you're in church. <laughs> the problem with that is, it doesn't help develop a personal relationship. I think you should pray more often than that, personally. What I do is I pray throughout the day. If I have time before I get the kids up, I'll pray in the morning. I do pray before I fall asleep at night. Most nights, I fall asleep praying. I don't ever get to amen. <laughs> I'm still talking to Jesus or whatever, and I drift off. Work. There's no amen at night. So I just imagine when I wake up in the morning, I don't really have to open it up new. I just continue. <laughs> we just hold that till the next day, and we'll finish that over that way. Um, and like I said, National Day of Prayer, you can pray throughout the day. There's many times during the day when you have a minute. And just take a minute. A lot of people are like, well, I only have like five minutes. It doesn't have to be a half an hour. You can pray in a minute and a half. It doesn't have to be this big, long, eloquent, you know, filled with pretty little scriptures and whatevers. It can just be, Lord, I've got a minute. Is there anything you want to show me today? Is there something I missed today? And just waiting and listening. It doesn't have to be a big, old, long, it's National Day of Prayer, and I'm going to join with the community, God, and we're three strands that can't be broken. And when we come together, we're going to be a stronger force because you don't have to go into a big mess. <laughs> You can if you feel led, but it doesn't have to be. And that's why a lot of people don't pray. They don't feel like they're giving enough time to God. God will take a minute. God will redeem time for you. And here's the last thing I really want you to know. A lot of people, and they've been taught. I, there was a, a lesson that I was taught as well that um, there's a formula to praying. Uh, we, we had some financial difficulties when we were young, and I had a minister say, well, you don't tithe faithfully, so you can't ask God for help financially. If you won't give him money, he's not going to give it to you. I believe that because that's a, 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 a religious leader. That's somebody in authority over my life. That's somebody who knew the Bible better than me. But looking back on that now, that means everything God does is dependent on me. Well, that must mean I'm stronger than God. Because if he's waiting for me to get permission to give to me, he's not a God I need to serve, quite frankly. I can do plenty without that kind of help. You know, we begin to think we can't ask for things because we haven't done things. You get um, ministers who will tell you that, do you want your loved one saved? Do you really want your husband saved? you got to fast. Fasting ain't going to get your husband saved any quicker than if you just pray. Because again, you're saying your actions will make God do what God's going to do. When you have prayer, when you have a relationship with God and God's going to bless you and grow you, it is not dependent on what you do, because if it is, that's a contract. That is a business agreement. That is a landlord, I pay you this much money, and I get to live in this house this long agreement. That's not what that is at all. Scripture never says we have to give anything to God. He did that in the Old Testament, but under Jesus, it said, hey, God's going to bless you because he sees you through the blood of Christ. He sees you perfect. He sees you flawless. As far as he's concerned, you've paid every debt. You've honored every commitment. Every promise has been fulfilled. And the only thing left is for him to fulfill his covenant promise of grace and goodness and mercy and salvation. And he's going to honor that because that's who he is. And it's Man. not based on what you do Man. or don't do, as the case may be. It's not based on any of that. There's no formula. They don't require your sacrifice to be heard. We have to get rid of this good enough theology. If I'm good enough, God will do that. No, no, won't. It's not dependent on if you're good enough. Because the problem is sometimes you get good enough. I've been in a legalistic church where you're given a guideline of what you have to do and what you have to be to be holy. And I've got it nailed. I'm telling you, I, was pretty, I felt pretty good about myself. I could have sat beside Jesus and God and been like, we're equals here. I tithe. 
I pledge when we're supposed to. I'm here every time the doors are open. I clean the toilets. I minister to the kids. I take the screaming babies and give the mamas a break. I cook dinners. I make the lunches in the kitchen. I handle the funeral services. Lord, I am it. I am on top of it. I have done everything, all in on the checklist. Spend my whole life, every day of every second, being exactly what you want me to be. I, I read for 45 minutes in the scriptures every day. I mean, I was killing it. And I was no more blessed than when I wasn't. I still was struggling financially. Still had sick kids. Still had a husband who I wanted more time with, but we had jobs and lives. And we had, we had, I kid you not, we had four anniversaries in a row where we did not see each other the day of our anniversary until we fell into bed that night. Wow. Both exhausted. We just, we were busy. We had kids in school and I was volunteering and he was working. We were making a life. And I was doing everything I could. And so there was moments when I was like, I didn't even, I didn't even see my husband for the last three days. You know, I didn't, my life wasn't better when I could check all those boxes. So my good enough theology, making myself good enough so God would be faithful and bless me, didn't work. So what does what happens then? You feel bitter and you feel like God's a liar. I did it all and you didn't hold up your part. And that's where I was the year my dad died. I did it all. And you didn't heal it. You took him anyway. You didn't hold up your part. You aren't faithful. You aren't true. You don't have good plans for me. This isn't good. This isn't holy. This is no testimony to draw people to you. Somebody who's given you everything and her dad dies anyway. How can I look at people and tell them God's a healer when my dad's six feet in the ground? No, you're a liar. It leaves you bitter and it leaves you begging for something to believe in and finding nothing is worth it. But the beautiful thing about good enough theology is God can break it in that moment. Because once you realize nothing you do is good enough, you also have to realize there is something that's good enough, and it's not you. It was never you. It was a relationship and a promise between God and Jesus. God told Christ if he sacrificed himself, all of humanity would be taken care of. Jesus did that, and God fulfills his end of the deal. You're not involved in that at all. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to change the deal. You can't take make Jesus get back on the cross. You can't make God go, oh, never mind, I don't think that was a good idea. You can't change the rules. It's already been done. So you can fast, and you can pray, and you can study, and you can jump through hoops and stand on your head and give more money than you have and overdraw your account to tithe. You can do whatever you want to do, but it's not going to change if that isn't the will of God. It's not going to change it, which is why it goes back to praying that God's will be your will. I never, the whole time my dad was sick, prayed that God's will be my will. I prayed that God would kill him because that's what you're supposed to do. This is my end of the deal. You have to hold up your end of the deal. And I, I kid you not, I honestly, 100% believe my dad was going to be healed. There was no question. I had the faith because I checked all the boxes. God was going to do that healing. And then he didn't. <laughs> I knew it. And then he didn't. I had all the faith in the world. The problem is I never prayed for God's will. And I forgot dad had a will too. And my dad was very sick and it had nothing to do with his cancer. He was mentally struggling. He'd been committed a few times. He had some suicide attempts growing up. He struggled. No question in my mind that he loved me. He, being a dad, he nailed. You know, I didn't grow up with daddy issues or anything like that. He wasn't a perfect man by any means, but there's no question that I was loved. And it never occurred to me that at some point during his sickness, God looked at Jesus and said, no more. I'm exhausted. My kids know I love them. My wife knows I love them. My friends know I love them. My family knows I've done my job here. I got my kids into church and they're saved, Lord. I got my kids back to you. My job is done. Do I have to stay and suffer? I had no idea there was a conversation going on between Dad and Jesus when Jesus was going, no. Come on. Of course you don't. And I can't imagine how he felt looking at my father and saying, Sweet boy, not one minute more do you have to suffer. And at the same time, hearing me say, make him stay. How that must have made God feel because I wasn't saying, make your will my will. 
make me want what you want. And you want my dad to be free. You want him to be healed. You want him to be happy with no worries. I don't. I want him here with me. I want him suffering and I want him fighting, but I want him here. Who prays that about their parent? I did for a whole year. And I was wrong and I didn't know it. Because I was worried about a good enough theology. I had done everything I was supposed to do and God was a liar and didn't do anything he was supposed to do. And the truth was, I wasn't praying the will of God. I was praying very selfish. And I had faith in me. I thought I was so holy that I had this unshakable faith that I could tell people God's going to heal that. I'm not even worried about God's. I had such faith and I didn't realize the faith was in me. It was in what I had done. What I had given, what I had tithed, what I had fasted, it was all in me. It had, I didn't have any faith in God. I put it all in doing good enough theology. Our prayers have got to get that out. We have got to quit thinking somehow we are going to make something happen for ourselves. We are not going to make something happen for ourselves. And we end up bitter and lost and in a place where we won't even talk to him until he finally breaks through. And lastly... We also need to stop going, well, I'll pray for that. When people talk to us, when they come to us and they say, I've had this trouble, I've had this struggle, I need this, and we can't help them. Like, maybe they need money and we don't have the money, or maybe they need a relationship fixed. And obviously, I can't fix somebody's relationship. But, and they just unburden themselves, and we go, well, we'll pray for you. Stop saying that. Because when you say that, you make prayer a last resort, and it's not. It's the first line of defense. Too often we go, well, there's nothing else we're going to do, so we might as well pray. That is not how that should work. It should be prayer first and then attempt to do the thing. If you know your friend is struggling, you're going to have lunch. You pray first. That's your first line of defense. God, she's struggling. I need you to soothe her heart. I need you to help her find that supernatural joy. I need you to make sure she knows that I'm here. And I'm not going to offer solutions, but I'm going to offer love. and I'm going to offer a safe place. Lord, help this relationship grow. Help her find what she needs for me. Help me say the right things and do the right things and then go to that meeting. And there's a huge difference between that meeting and the one where you go to the meeting and go, I'll pray about it. It's not a last resort. It's the first line of defense. Do it first. Do it before you start that ministry. Do it before you make that phone call. Do it before you meet with that friend. Not later because you got nothing left to do for them. It doesn't work that way. And I'm not saying don't pray later if you forgot. By all means, pray later. I'm just saying you're us making it like it's all that's left. It's all that's needed, really. Amen. And we don't treat it like that. So when we go into the National Day of Prayer and you think, all right, how do I pray? What am I supposed to pray? Why does it matter? Should I be at church? All of it works. Um, I had a, there was a, um, I think it's Dad Hagen, uh, Kenneth Hagen Sr., who used to preach that if you pray for something more than once, you don't have faith. Because God's not deaf. If you say, Lord, heal my husband, you should never pray again. Because if you pray again, you don't have faith. And I thought, that's a pretty harsh way to look at that. <laughs> because honestly, prayer moves you, not God. God already knows your husband needs healed. You're praying to get yourself in the state of mind that you can be in the will of God. Prayer oftentimes comes back to... Isn't it great how God makes everything about us and we're not supposed to make any of it about us? It's about saving us. It's about blessing us. It's about growing us. And all we're supposed to do is give it all back to him and we just make it a big whole mess. You can pray about something 700 times. It doesn't mean you don't have faith. It means you need reassurance. And we all need reassurance sometimes. We all look at situations and go, God, I have no idea what you're doing and I am scared to death. It's okay to say that. <laughs> he knows. He knows you're afraid. He also knows if you'll just sit with him for a minute, undivided attention, he can make it better. He can make you say, I don't know what's going on, but I ain't even scared because God's will will be done. And God's will is good because I read my word, because I memorize my scripture of the week, because I know what the bread of life says. I know who Jesus is. So it looks crazy. It looks daunting, but it's God's will, and I'm in line with that. I'm okay with that. I'm ready for that. So when we go into the National Day of Prayer, it doesn't matter if you're praying for the same thing again. It doesn't matter if it's the first time you've prayed for it. It doesn't matter if you can get together corporately and do it or if you have to do it by yourself in the evening or in the morning. However it works, prayer works. It's not You can't be good enough. You can't be bad enough. There's nothing you've done that's going to make God go, well, I'm not going to listen to her. I'll, I'll listen to a few things, but 
some of that's ridiculous. He's not doing that. <laughs> He's not divvying up, but he's not triaging our prayers. Well, this prayer is a lot more important than that one, so it'll wait and cue. That's not how it works. God doesn't work on a linear time frame here. He can do it all at once. It's God. So it's not dependent on that. And when we realize that, we have a more confident prayer. Scripture says that we are supposed to boldly approach the throne of grace. The reason we don't is because we get sucked into the good enough theology and we forget to pray for his will to be our own. We miss the point. Don't miss the point this week. Don't miss the point in National Day of Prayer or for the rest of your life. I mean, obviously not just on Thursday. Don't miss the point. Let God have a minute with you. A few minutes with you. Let him speak to you. Listen with your face. <laughs> Let him love you the way only God can and make you better. Father, we're thankful that we can pray. God, we're thankful that all we have to do is say your name. God, that such power radiates from the name of Jesus that nothing can, can interfere with that prayer. Nothing can stop that signal from getting through. Lord, we're thankful that we can pray together corporately and know that makes us stronger. And Lord, we know praying with you one-on-one -on -one has just as much power as anything else we could say or do. God, I pray that you inhabit us today, tomorrow, Thursday. Lord, I pray as we go throughout our lives, we feel you and we see you in a way that we haven't before, that we look for opportunities to know that you're right with us and that every word can be a prayer. Every action can be a prayer because God, it isn't about us. It's about you and Jesus has already done. You are so thankful for that. And we pray for your protection and your goodness for all of those that fall under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.